Can you feel them in your fingers, in your toes? How about in your lungs? Vibrations are all around us. Animals use vibrations to do so much, and so can we. So let's explore some everyday vibrations, starting with the ones animals use to survive and thrive. You probably figured birds would be on the list of vibrating animals for their incredible vocal cords, but they have another vibration adaptation you might not know about. Birds have a lot of predators, and eggs are especially vulnerable to becoming someone's breakfast. So chicks have developed a way to communicate danger to each other while they are still in eggs. Here's Michael to tell us more. You might think eggs just kind of lie there, totally oblivious to the outside world. After all, the building of a baby bird is all happening on the inside. But science has shown that eggs are actually pretty tuned in to what's happening outside the shell. And in 2019, scientists learned something even more incredible. Eggs aren't just listening, they can communicate with each other. Eggs can talk to other eggs. Scientists learned this by studying a colony of yellow-legged gulls on the Spanish island of Salvora, where chicks are often eaten by predators like mink. They've known from previous research that, in some species, bird moms communicate with their chicks through the egg wall, and in response, those chicks adapt in a way that prepares them for life's challenges. So in the 2019 study, which was published in Nature Ecology and Evolution, the researchers wanted to see if these gull chicks could be prepped to deal with their predators before they even hatched. To do that, the scientists made artificial nests in the lab and put three eggs in them about a week before they were due to hatch. Every day, they removed two of the eggs, always the same two, and put them in a soundproof box where they played recordings of alarm calls from adult birds in the colony. Then they reunited the two eggs with their nestmate, which hadn't been exposed to any noise. After a week of this, the scientists returned the eggs to the colony just in time for them to hatch, then brought them back to the lab once the chicks were two days old. They found that the chicks that were exposed to alarm calls in the egg were quieter than chicks from a control group. They also had higher levels of stress hormones and were faster to hide by crouching any time scientists played the alarm call. Which was pretty strong evidence that even inside the egg, chicks were adapting to deal with threats out in the real world. But what was amazing was that the third egg in the nest, which developed in complete peace, behaved just like the other two, even though it had never heard a single alarm itself. Somehow, the siblings were passing on warnings to their nestmates, egg to egg. The researchers think the eggs were communicating through vibrations. Eggs that heard alarm calls vibrated more, and their siblings picked up those cues. Then, in both cases, there was an increase in a process called DNA methylation, which changes how genes are expressed without changing the genetic code. The researchers don't know exactly what those changes do to a growing chick, but they seem to shape its response to fear. That could explain how all these eggs instinctively knew how to be quiet and hide, even the ones that had never heard the warning signals themselves. And birds may not be alone. Studies from other creatures that lay eggs, like turtles, have also shown that egg siblings may talk to each other. Like, they may give each other cues to hatch faster if the nest gets flooded, or time things so that siblings hatch together and have safety in numbers against predators. So the peaceful eggs you might see in a nest are likely chatting away, gearing up for a tough world, and looking out for each other. So chicks can communicate with each other. What about animals that can communicate with other species through vibrations? What about an animal that interacts with plants using vibrations? The buzzword here is pollination. Animals and plants often work together, and one well-known example is bees pollinating flowers. What's that got to do with vibrations? I will tell you. Plenty of insects buzz when they fly around, like beetles and that little of a mosquito. I hate that noise so much. But bees are kind of special. There are more than 20,000 species of bees, all of which buzz when they fly, and many of which also do it to communicate. But some bees buzz for a completely different reason that has nothing to do with communication or with flight. They're trying to get pollen out of flowers in what's known as buzz pollination. The kind of buzzing we hear when bees fly comes from their wings, which they can flap at up to 230 beats per second. Their quick wing movements cause air vibrations, which your ear translates to sound. The faster the wings beat, the higher the pitch. And if you've ever had the unfortunate experience of disturbing a hive, you've probably seen them buzz a little louder in agitation. But in buzz pollination, they generate sound energy by vibrating their bodies, not their wings. They use the same muscles they'd normally use to move their wings, but kind of separate their wings from those muscles, so their bodies vibrate instead at about 400 
100 beats per second. This full body vibration causes the distinct buzzing sound you hear when bees are on a flower, which is a bit louder and higher pitched than regular flying buzzing. It's actually in the tone of middle C. That exact middle C buzzing is like a secret passcode that unlocks pollen trapped inside flowers. But bees don't need to do it for every kind of flower. Most flowers are like a buffet. Their pollen is on the outside of the anther, the male part of the flower, and just about anyone can come take it. But there are some flowers, like the ones on tomato and blueberry plants, that have poricidal anthers. These anthers lock the pollen inside of them with just a small pore for an opening. To get the pollen out, the bees wrap their legs around the flower, bite down on the anther for grip, and buzz. And when they vibrate at that super high speed, the pollen bounces up and down in the tube, and when it gains enough momentum, a bunch of it explodes out and lands on the bee. Only some bees can do this, like bumblebees and a few kinds of solitary bees. Honeybees can't. But for the record, you don't really need a bee if you want to get the pollen out. A tuning fork will do. Or if you want to get more high-tech, you can get tools to vibrate the plant at the right frequency, which yes, do exist, and people actually use them to pollinate their plants, although they are not as efficient as the natural method. Because when it comes to getting up close and personal with a flower, bees are definitely the experts. Of course, we can't get too far talking about vibrations without getting into sound. If you can hear me talking right now, it is likely because your eardrum is vibrating. And ears are a surprisingly complicated part of the body that work in a variety of ways across the animal kingdom. Frogs, for example, don't have external ears like we do, but they can still appreciate sounds around them because they listen with their lungs. Now, I know that sounds wild, but when Stefan says it, it makes sense. Frogs often have a lot to say. Just ask the residents of the Big Island of Hawaii, who get serenaded by tiny invasive koki frogs every night. But if you've ever looked at a frog's head, you might have noticed that they don't have external ears. So it might seem weird that they're able to hear those calls. Well, it turns out that they rely on other ways of getting information about sounds to their brains, including listening with their lungs. Amphibian hearing works a lot like human hearing, except instead of eardrums buried in an ear canal, most frogs have a tympanic membrane right on their heads. When a sound wave hits that membrane, it starts to vibrate. And those vibrations start a chain reaction that ends with fluid vibrating against special cells in the frog's inner ear. When these cells move, they send out an electrical signal that travels to the auditory center of the brain. Low frequency vibrations stimulate the cells in one part of the ear, while high frequency vibrations stimulate the cells in a different part. So the brain figures out what pitch the sound is by which part of the ear the signal comes from. But when you're a female frog looking for love, you need more than the pitch of a sound. You also need to know where it came from, and the tympanic membrane can help with that too. A sound wave will actually hit the tympanic membranes on both sides of the head. And for each, it travels across the mouth and through a channel called the eustachian tube, which connects the mouth to the tympanic membrane on the other side. So the sound wave ends up reaching both tympanic membranes from both the outside and the inside. But the pressure is usually stronger on the side a sound came from. So the difference tells the frog where her suitor is. But the problem is, sometimes this system doesn't work. For one thing, when a sound is low-pitched, there actually isn't much difference between the pressure on the two sides of the membrane. And some frogs, like the koki frog, have tympanic membranes that are too small to respond much, if at all, to low-pitched sounds. You see, the amount of sound energy a surface experiences is directly proportional to the area of that surface. And both lower frequency and lower volume sounds carry less energy. So smaller tympanic membranes don't capture much energy from low-frequency or quiet noises. And if a frog's tympanic membranes are small enough, normal volume, low frequency sounds basically don't move them at all. But luckily for these frogs, their lungs lend a hand and help them hear. Sound waves passing through the body cause the lungs to vibrate like a giant eardrum. Those vibrations pass through the vocal cords up to the mouth, where they can use those eustachian tube highways to reach the tympanic membrane from the inside, creating that pressure differential that localizes sound. Since the lungs have a larger surface area, they can pick up the lower frequency sounds that the tympanic membranes can't. And 
And for some species, the lungs replace the tympanic membranes entirely. We know this because when scientists studied frogs that lack tympanic membranes, the vibration of their lungs matched activity in the sound processing parts of their brains. And then when they covered their bodies in a centimeter and a half of noise dampening silicone grease, or filled their lungs with saline to limit their ability to vibrate, the neural response shrank. So it was clear that the sound had to vibrate the lungs for the frogs to hear. And researchers actually think that this kind of body hearing is how the very first amphibians might have listened to the world around them, before the tympanic membrane even evolved. So the next time you're out for a walk after it rains and you hear a symphony of frogs, it might be fun to think about all the amazing biology going on to make it possible. It's pretty awesome to think about using your lungs to hear things, but sometimes I think even my ears are doing a little too much. Like, sometimes I think I hear my phone ring or I feel it vibrate when it has not. Next up, Olivia explains these figments of our vibration imaginations. How many times has this happened to you? Your phone mm -hmm. buzzes, you grab it and unlock the screen, but there's no notification in sight. You've experienced a phantom phone vibration, or what some experts call phantom vibration syndrome. The good news is it's super common and not harmful on its own. But how often you experience these phantom buzzes may hold clues about your mental health in general. Results differ from study to study, but researchers are pretty sure phantom vibrations affect a lot of people. Phantom ringing is also a thing, but not all studies look at both at the same time. So we're going to focus on the buzzing. In one of the earliest studies of the subject in 2010, they found that around 68% of participants experienced some kind of phantom buzz. This was before most people carried smartphones in their pocket, so the researchers studied medical staff who always carried phones or pagers on vibrate mode. In the years since then, researchers have found some factors that make you more or less likely to feel the vibrations in the first place, like a younger age, keeping your phone on vibrate, and keeping it in a breast pocket. But these mystery vibrations themselves don't seem to be doing any harm. They're more of a quirk of our normal senses. Phantom phone vibes are likely a false alarm in something called our signal detection system, which is exactly what it sounds like. Our brains receive some sort of vague stimulus, like a light touch or dull noise, and make a decision about what it means. In the case of phantom phone vibrations, our brain has interpreted some other stimulus as a notification. That stimulus could be a familiar noise or a commonplace muscle twitch that kinda sorta maybe feels or sounds like a vibration. Plus, we expect to get notifications, and that makes our brains more likely to interpret other stimuli, or even a lack thereof, as a phone vibration. Getting false alarms from our signal detection system isn't necessarily a bad thing, but researchers have wondered if conditions like anxiety or depression might predispose us to experience false vibes more often. One 2013 study followed 74 medical interns over the course of a year-long internship, and measured how often they felt phantom buzzes, as well as any symptoms of anxiety and depression. The researchers expected the interns would feel more phantom vibrations as their stress and anxiety increased. But in the end, phantom vibes happened totally independently of the participants' anxiety. On the other hand, a different study in 2014 looked specifically at tech employees and found that phantom vibes were associated with job stress and burnout. So there's no clear answer yet, but if you notice yourself checking on a blank screen more often, ask yourself if you've been feeling stressed lately. At least phone vibrations aren't too powerful. Maybe that's another reason they're so easy to detect by mistake. But some vibrations are much stronger. According to legend, that includes the human voice. It is said that some singers can actually shatter glass just by finding the right note. But is that true? Remember that scene in Prisoner of Azkaban where the lady in the Gryffindor painting tries to break her wine glass with her voice? Even though she doesn't succeed, you might be able to. Thanks to science. Sound is just vibrations, and it can break glass by making it vibrate so hard that it shatters. See, every material has what's called a resonance frequency, the frequency at which it'll naturally tend to vibrate. That frequency or frequencies, since there can be more than one, just depend on its physical properties. A guitar string, for example, will vibrate at its resonance frequencies when you pluck it, which is what produces the sound. Since it's easy for something to vibrate at its resonance frequency, when it's hit with sound waves of that frequency, its molecules will start oscillating back and forth with the wave. Those vibrations 
oscillations will get stronger and stronger, like how a swing will go higher and higher if you push it at exactly the right intervals. And if something vibrates hard enough, eventually the vibrations will stretch it to the point that it breaks. Most things can vibrate pretty hard before breaking, but even strong materials like stone and concrete have their limits. A glass is much easier to shatter, especially if it's thin. It also helps if it's old or cheap, because older and cheaper glasses are more likely to have flaws that can act as seeds for cracks to form. We here at SciShow don't recommend you destroy your glassware or put yourself in situations where you can get hit with flying shards of glass, but hypothetically, to break a glass with sound, you'd first need to figure out its resonance frequency by tapping it gently with a fork or rubbing a wet finger around the rim of the glass until you hear it sing. That's the note to match. It's most likely just over 500 hertz, or vibrations per second, like a high C. Some glasses might be harder to crack if the glass is too thick or if the right note is out of your vocal range. And you have to be loud, over 100 decibels. That's louder than your hairdryer or vacuum cleaner. When the Mythbusters had rock singer Jamie Vendera try this, he attempted to break 12 different glasses before finally shattering one by singing a 556 hertz note at 105 decibels. The problem is, to break the glass with just the power of your lungs, you'd have to hold the glass in front of your face, which means that if you succeed, the glass will shatter right in front of you. That is a very bad idea, and please don't try it. Instead, you can put a safe distance between you and the glass, grab a mic and amp, and crank up the volume. But don't go overboard. You can shatter the glass with any frequency if the volume is loud enough. Sound is just pressure waves of air, and if you increase the pressure enough, you'll smash the glass by force. That's not nearly as cool, and besides, you'd probably rupture your eardrums too, which is another thing we don't recommend. A little boost on the right note will break the glass easily without destroying your ears. Once you're all set up, put a straw on the glass and start singing into the mic. Adjust your pitch until you see the straw start to bounce around, and that's how you know you're close. If you can hold the right note for several seconds, the glass will break. Good luck, and be careful cleaning up afterward. But vibrations aren't just about destruction. Humans have found some pretty cool ways to create things with vibrations. Things like art. Olivia is going to show you how. Cymatics are visual patterns that combine three ingredients. A thin plate, a pinch of loose material like sand or salt, and a heavy dose of music. They let us actually see sound, and it's kind of beautiful. Sound is a vibration through a medium like air that eventually vibrates our eardrums, which triggers an electrical signal to our brain that we interpret as noise. But these waves can vibrate more than just our eardrums. They vibrate everything in their path. If you yell loudly enough, for example, the sound waves are strong enough to vibrate through a whole wall, which is why you might get complaints from your neighbors. Sometimes you can see these vibrations, like when your rock and roll garage band shakes and rattles everything in the house, also an activity that might attract angry neighbors. These vibrations may seem like mini earthquakes, but every single one follows the laws of physics. And it's easy to see these laws in action when sound waves go through something visible, like sand. One way to make cymatics is to spread sand over a thin plate and then produce sound waves right in the center. The sound waves spread out from the center, which makes the plate and the sand vibrate. One of the principles that helps create cymatics is the idea that sound waves are longitudinal waves. That means the particles the wave is moving through are vibrating in the same direction as the wave itself. The particles move back and forth so there are areas of compression where all the particles have moved really close to one another, and some areas of expansion where all the particles have moved away from one another. But there's more! To make your beautiful artwork, you have to make something called a standing wave. A standing wave is pretty much what it sounds like, a wave that looks like it's standing still. It happens when the sound wave travels to the edge of a plate and breaks into two parts. One part of the wave will keep going out into the air, but the other part of the wave will reflect, which means it turns back around and starts moving towards where it came from. These reflected waves then overlap with new incoming waves. When two waves interfere with each other, their effects either add or subtract from one another. Like if you look at just one grain of sand and both waves are trying to vibrate it to the left, the sand will move farther to the left. That's constructive interference. But if one wave is vibrating the sand to the left while the other wave is vibrating it to the right, they'll cancel each other out. So the sand won't move much at all, and that's called destructive interference. These spots where the sand stays still are called nodes. At certain frequencies, these nodes will be permanent because all of the waves will keep canceling each other out. Meanwhile, other spots will have as much constructive interference as possible, so the sand is moving super fast and much less noticeably. It might look like there's no wave traveling through the sand at all, but Really, it's two waves moving in opposite directions. Different frequencies can make a lot of different standing waves. 
and therefore different patterns. In fact, the higher the frequency, the more cycles of the waves you can fit onto one plate and the more intricate your image becomes. We've just been talking about flat plates so far, but sound waves can actually move in all directions, so you can actually make these patterns in 3D. It's pretty tricky to do, because you have to account for the fact that gravity is trying to pull the sand or whatever else you're using to create the pattern, to the ground. But at the University of Tokyo, a group of researchers were up for the challenge. In 2014, they announced that they'd used ultrasound waves, tiny styrofoam balls, and the right interference pattern to make art float in midair. Just like in the plate, the sound waves have constructive and destructive interference. At the nodes, this effect was strong enough to overcome gravity and allow the styrofoam to stay perfectly still. They'd created floating art, and in the process, discovered a new way to make things levitate. So vibrations are some of the most versatile and useful forces in the world. They help plants and animals survive, but they also help us live our best lives through ingenuity and creativity. Thank you for watching this episode of SciShow. If you liked the video, or maybe if you didn't like this video, you might like our next video about how to remove vibrations.